I'm Paul McGuire, and uh, I'm talking about the, the gravity of the situation that America is facing right now, the, the convergence and acceleration of uh, events, first economically. Um, we are on the verge of an economic collapse, whether it's slow or fast, unless the, the major foundational problems are addressed. Life in America is going to be radically different uh, for you and me and our children. There will be no more middle class. There are things going on economically that are not being communicated to you with full disclosure by the predominant media and the reason for that is they're owned by the six corporations that also own the banks and uh, the banks are owned by an international elite of uh, bankers uh, that have a spiritual component to them. Uh, the Illuminati, and I know that sounds conspiratorial, but you're, you're going to have to do some homework on that. I discussed it in part one of this uh, video. This is part two. Uh, there's ample proof for that, and so I'm not going to go through the, the proof text if you want to read some of my books like The Day the Dollar Died or my new one, A Prophecy of the Future of America. I go into it and I document it, and many others have also. Um, first and foremost, there's the uh, uh, senior council of the World Bank, um, which is above the Federal Reserve Bank here in the U.S., and uh, she's a graduate of Yale. She, she was uh, uh, one of the highest ranking officials in the World Bank and she became a whistleblower along with other whistleblowers that have uh, come out of the World Bank and she has gone into great detail talking about the fact that there is a secretive elite uh, that is controlling the world uh, financial system and they do have plans to destroy the dollar and they are going to use currency wars to do it and they are in the process of destroying the middle class and um, these are things that I discussed in my book uh, The Day the Dollar Died and many other people have written about and uh, she is an insider at the very highest level and she looked at where the money went and uh, you, can, you can't dismiss her as a conspiracy theorist because <laughs> She's at a higher economic level than just about anybody you'd ever meet. And she validates what many of us have been trying to warn about for decades. So we have that economic superstorm coming down upon us very quickly. Uh, we have this frenzy and acceleration of uh, freak weather, earthquakes, storms, uh, tsunamis, um, um, tornadoes. Uh, we have the potential of plagues and epidemics, just like Christ described in the Signs of the Times. Uh, social anarchy, riots, the high probability of an event sometime in the near future, uh, which could bring about martial law. And John Whitehead, a constitutional attorney who I greatly respect, uh, and also someone who was uh, directly influenced by Francis Schaeffer, as I was. Uh, warns in detail uh, through his Rutherford Institute about just how brutal martial law will be. It's, it's, not a, it's not a happy face on it. So these problems are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the immorality in America is off the charts if you're a Christian. And the um, statement that I made in the first part of this video is, well, what can we do about it? Can something be done about it? And my answer to that is yes. And again, I need to briefly review um, a problem for some uh, when you go down that trail. First of all, I believe that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God. But before I get into that, though, for those of you who are only watching part two, I'm the author of 22 books, a conference speaker, a, a professor of Bible prophecy. I've debated leading economists. 
uh, on the largest cable news network uh, TV shows with the, the biggest hosts for years. I've debated leading economists and I've debated the publishers of the largest financial publications in America and the world. And if I went down the list, you'd know the names of the publications. So I do have knowledge and expertise. I've also interviewed prime ministers and presidents and I'm not going to give my whole bio uh, here, but if you want to know about my credentials, you can go to paulmcguire.com or paulmcguire.org and read my bio. Okay, having said that, um, is there anything we can do about uh, the what I believe is the judgment of God upon our nation or the lifting of God's hand uh, from our nation specifically because the church uh, has violated the word of God. Not, not pointing the finger at other groups and saying all these problems are, are happening because of the sins of this group or that group or the other group because the Bible says judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And all the problems that we're seeing in America and in different places around the world, really, from a spiritual standpoint, they are a mirror reflection of the spiritual condition of the heart of the Church of America. In other words, there's a direct relationship between, let's just say, hypothetically, this virtual reality, it's not virtual, it's real, but for the sake of the uh, uh, metaphor, this virtual reality all around us, which is horrific, tornadoes, riots in the streets, all of this is being generated out of the heart of the church. Now, it's a holographic project projection emanating from the spiritual condition of the church. And I want to be real precise about what I say here, because the Bible says that First, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So the church, because the church has the light, uh, the, tr the church has the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, and the, the church has the word of God, the church is responsible uh, to a much higher degree than, than, than a non-believing culture. And the church has been unfaithful to the Lord. And that is the primary reason for the judgment holographic that we see or virtual reality we see which is real all around us it's a projection of the disobedience of the church and the severing of the relationship between the church and its creator God the Lord Jesus Christ or the personal living God of the universe now the pilgrims and the Puritans and the apostles and the Christians for centuries and the children of Israel all understood the relationship between external calamities being judgments from God. I mean, for e even pagan nations understand that. Even pagan nations around the world who don't have the Bible, uh, even in their religions, they understand that there's a relationship between calamity and they're uh, displeasing uh, the deities or their gods. They have some primitive understanding of the cause and effect relationship between what they have done and, and the bad or goodness of their reality. It's only modern uh, American evangelical Christians and Europeans, etc., who have rejected uh, the authority of God's word and embraced secular humanism that, that have adopted this nonsensical view of reality, which is an Alice in Wonderland reality, that somehow there's no relationship between these horrific events and the inner spiritual condition of the people. I'm telling you that just on the basis of science and physics, you could prove the direct cause and effect relationship based on science alone between external reality and internal reality. In other words, we live in a universe uh, that's multi-dimensional and there is a fourth dimension. 
And um, Tesla knew that, and scalar technology is based on the fourth dimension, and quantum physics and uh, uh, string theory uh, is based on the idea that there's 11 dimensions in this hyper-dimensional universe. And string theory talks about subatomic particles that vibrate almost like strings, almost like music. And I would suggest to you that on a subatomic level, the spiritual reality, the morality or immorality, the breaking of God's word, the cruelty, the, the injustices done to people, literally create and energize events in the subatomic world that are transformed as negative events because you're putting out negative energy as you sow shall you reap. I mean, that's a universal principle of all kinds of religions. But that same dynamic is taught in the Bible, and the pilgrims and Puritans understood that when their crops failed, and then when they were dying from diseases, and they were dying and being killed by their enemies, they understood, because they had made a covenant with God based on the covenant that God, uh, that, that God made with the children of Israel, that uh, there was a cause and effect relationship between the, the, the horrible negative things happening to them and their spiritual condition, and so they would weep, fast, and repent in order to see God bless their crops, uh, heal their diseases, and restore order and peace to their land. The children of Israel knew this. It was taught to them by Moses in the Mosaic Covenant in Deuteronomy 28. There's, there's a long list of blessings, and their economic blessings, and their agricultural blessings, and their uh, blessings of peace from your enemies, their geopolitical blessings, and their blessings in childbirth, and their very specific blessings on a societal, economic level. And the condition, according to Moses, was that you diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. That means you diligently hearken unto the word of God because the voice of God is the word of God. And then that you serve the Lord thy God and you don't follow idols, false gods, and that you keep these commandments. And if you do, there's a blessing supernaturally on the children of Israel. Conversely, in Deuteronomy 28, a half at the end of the blessings, there's what is called the curses, and it's a long list of specific curses that are geopolitical and economic and weather-related in nature. And if God's people, the children of Israel, broke the commandments of God, rejected his word, disobeyed his word, and, and followed after false gods, all these curses would come upon them. A direct cause and effect relationship that was pretty obvious to them. And if God was displeased, it was obvious because it would be revealed in, in the, the storms, weather, wars, tragedies, disease epidemics, economic failures. It was very clear to them. And um, some people say, well, you know, that was a covenant God made with the Jews. Well, God deals with the church in a different manner, but there are similarities that are carried over. It's not a perfect transfer, but it's transferable nevertheless. And the pilgrims and Puritans understood that. Our founding fathers understood that, and they were deep theologians. So here we are in America at the edge of, of, of a precipice of cataclysm, and that's not a sensationalistic statement. America is now approaching the final hour. I mean, the game is up. Anybody who reads the secular forecasters who are atheistic, simply analyze the economic data, understand minimally the economics 
and you will understand that America will no longer cease to exist as a nation as we know it in the near future. That is a reality. And that's simply based on secular economic forecasting and projections. And this lady who was the f former head of the, the uh, legal counsel, the, the, the senior counsel of the World Bank, uh, ex said that. Not, not, not this. Well, actually, she did talk about spiritual cause and effects. Uh, but she detailed the economic uh, endgame. And then we have this, the, the crisis of weather and riots in the streets and the potential of martial law and the loss of the Constitution and uh, uh, living under a military dictatorship. These are not paranoid extremist uh, conspiracy theories. Analysts with the highest integrity in geopolitical social trends, experts in all secular fields, concur that this is our future. Now, given that reality, and you can see it happening now, just turn on the television news every day. Look at what's happening. Open your eyes. It's a nightmare come true. That's what's happening. But here is the root problem. The root problem is a violation of the fundamental laws of the universe, which are the laws of the personal living God of the universe, that he has revealed in his word, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the inspired and errant word of God, he's revealed it to mankind, and, and he's specifically re revealed it to the children of Israel and to the church. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. The calamities are nightmarish. Now, what is the response of the majority of the evangelical church to the nightmare that is about to come to become our reality? What is the response? And I'm not embellishing, by the way. I'm passionate. You know why I'm passionate? Because I deeply care for your children and grandchildren, and I deeply care for you because of the agape love of Jesus Christ, because of the Holy Spirit in my life. He imparts in me, however imperfect I am, and I'm very imperfect, He imparts in me the love of God, and I can feel the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. I can, it's like Christ is weeping over America and uh, uh, over what's about to befall it. This is not his will for America. It wasn't his plan. Because what happens to America will radically affect the entire world. But here's the root problem. The largest percentage of his church in America, the evangelical church, is in a collective state of denial about what's happening. They're denying reality. They're denying the evidence all around them. That is a very, very grave and serious sin. It's huge. It's a sin on the level of the sin that Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden when they were in paradise and they disobeyed the word of God and listened to the voice of the serpent. That's where the evangelical church is. It's in denial. They're saying, it's not true. We don't want to believe it. They're denying the truth. But denying the truth is simply evidence that they're denying God, that their, their spiritual condition, of which we all share in, so I should say my spiritual condition, because to whatever degree I'm part of it, and so are you, to whatever degree, our spiritual condition is um, we're denying reality, which is rebellion from God. As long as that spiritual condition exists, the judgment will escalate. The moment we 
truly repent over the root sin, and I just identified the root sin, the, uh, the fake and phony repentance and the posturing and the playing politics with God, is, is, it's, that's an abomination before God. The gravity of our situation in America right now at this moment is so, so serious that, a, that if the pulpits of America and the majority of the evangelical leaders, there are many who are walking with God, most aren't, were, if they were, simply had their eyes open and were listening to the call of the Holy Spirit on the church, by Christ himself, they would immediately respond by 24 hours, seven days a week, repentance, fasting, and pray, prayer specifically, and cry out to God in an intercession. Because the crisis is cataclysmic. And yet you can walk through the doors of the average evangelical church in America and it's, they're in a fantasy world. They don't preach and teach the Word of God with any seriousness. They don't believe the Word of God, although they say they do. And that atmosphere of unreality and collective denial is the root sin that's causing the, the calamities. See, people want to blame it on this group, or that group, or this political party, or this president, or that president. That's not the root problem. The root problem is the spiritual condition of the church, because the Bible says, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So, if we want to see the brakes put on, if we want to see God's power move into our nation. If we want to see God drive our enemies back, and this affects the whole world, and you can pray this prayer wherever you are in the world, we're going to have to call on God, and we're going to have to repent specifically, because God is holy, and God has laws. But I'm telling you, as somebody who loves you and your children and who's motivated by concern and passion, if we insist on participating in this co collective rebellion against God, this collective denial of reality against the truth, we're going to perish. We're not, we're not any better than any other nation. Billy Graham said that quite, quite well. We're going to perish. And we will be made an example, as Israel was, because we had so much of the truth. Do you understand what, what, what is at stake? Do you understand how serious the hour is? If you don't, then you're denying reality. And if you participate in a church which is all about a collective denial of reality, I would suggest to you that you are part of the problem and not part of the solution. And you, like I, will be held accountable at the judgment seat of Christ. We're accountable. Now, what would be an impediment to people crying out and seeking God? Well, first and foremost, the denial of reality and rebellion from God. That would be the first reason there wouldn't be fasting and repentance and a crying out to God. Number two is a misunderstanding of Bible prophecy that somehow, if we pray, if we fast, that we're going to somehow undo God's prophetic program. First and foremost, I want to say it's impossible to undo God's prophetic program. God's prophetic end times, last days program will unfold exactly like he said it would in his word. All of that will be fulfilled. No man can undo it. The last days is going to happen as God uh, wrote about it through his prophets and the vision given to John on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation and the Apostle Paul in the words of Jesus Christ. That will all unfold literally as it is written. And there's no fasting or repentance that you can do to stop the tribulation, to stop the, the rise of the Antichrist, to, to stop the return of Jesus Christ, and all the other, or, or Armageddon, or all those other prophetic events. 
The misunderstanding, and it's a deadly misunderstanding, is that there's a confusion about praying and fasting over situations in America or in Cyprus or Europe or whatever nation you're in, the Philippines, and calling on God for his grace and mercy and collective repentance and seeing God divinely intervene in our nations. There's a confusion between that and what is God's uh, written word in the prophetic scriptures. And one guy called me when I was hosting a syndicated talk show, host, uh, talk show, and he said, won't we overturn God's prophetic program if we pray like that? That's impossible. God is sovereign. So God's answer to the prayer may be no. But our responsibility, according to the scripture, and that's our final authority, God has given us the privilege and the responsibility and the call to pray to him, to engage in spiritual warfare, to fast, pray, and repent. Here's just one example among many. First of all, the Bible says pray always. That means pray for your nation. Why would the Bible say pray always? And nowhere does it say pray always except in the last of the last days. It doesn't say that. It says pray always. So we're, we're mandated to pray. Number two is we're to pray specifically for all those in authority above us. It's presidents, uh, military leaders, economic leaders, nationally, locally, and worldwide. And you pray for the president whether you like him or dislike him. You're commanded to pray and for the elected representatives that govern this nation and the unelected representatives. Why? Because it's not about agreeing with them, it's about praying for them. That's a commandment. That's the only way God can move his power uh, into the dimensions or their sphere of activity and influence them is through your prayers, not your complaining. <clears throat> and I'm not negating the need for the necessity to participate and show up as citizens in the public uh, process and the political process. I'm not talking about some kind of mystical escapism. So, um, you, we, pray, we pray for those who are in authority in, in the last days because there's a promise that we will live, live quiet and peaceable lives. So there's the promise of a blessing if God's people seek his face. We can also call upon God to intervene and heal our nation. Now, God can always say no. But right now, there has been no adequate repentance, no adequate crying out to God. That's why everything we see around us is, is judgment and getting worse. So, we, we have been given the divine privilege as the Church of Jesus Christ to call on his name. Examples are made throughout the Old Testament of kings who sought the Lord, prophets who sought the Lord, as God was going to judge a nation. And many times, as people sought the Lord, God uh, gave a reprieve. God limited the judgment. God poured out a blessing. God poured out restoration, sometimes temporary. But the point is, God always responds to the prayers of his people, and we should be praying, not denying reality. And this is not in conflict with Bible prophecy. This is not Christian reconstructionism, dominionism, and all the rest of that stuff. This is simply obeying what the Word of God says and understanding that judgment begins in the house of the Lord and that there, God is a holy God, God's love, but God's a holy God, and when you violate his laws, there are consequences. But when you have the majority of the evangelical church in America completely denying reality, pretending nothing's going wrong, that is a symptom of a deep, deep spiritual sickness, which is not a sickness, it's a sin, and it's a rebellion from God 
And that rebellion from God by the church and the leaders that we all participate in to one degree or another is the cause of what we're seeing happening in our nation. Now, unless that is addressed aggressively through specific repentance and a crying out to God, we're going to perish. We'll go into a new kind of America that will be hell on earth. So, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to come before the Lord, even if we have to do it privately. And my question to you, by the way, would be, if you claim to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ, what business do you have being part of a body, a local assembly of believers, that is in collective unbelief or in collective rebellion uh, before God? If that is your state of affairs, you, you know where you are spiritually? You are um, exactly where the children of Israel were when Moses was coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel had built a golden calf for themselves to worship and they were having a sexual orgy and worshiping this false god. That's exactly where you are. They thought it was all right. They reinforced each other's behavior. So if you are plugged in to a local assembly that is in denial of reality, denies the full text of the inspired and inerrant word of God, as so many evangelical churches do in America, then you share in that guilt to a very high degree. And unless you unplug from that, and plug into a body of believers that are seeking God and reading his word seriously, um, you will be held accountable by God, as I will. So, in this hour of crisis, there's one thing to do. We need to, to first of all, it's not about emotionalism. This is not about whipping ourselves into some kind of frenzy. God is not impressed with emotion Emotion doesn't, emotionalism doesn't move the hand of God unless the emotionalism is a byproduct of genuine repentance. So we focus in on the root issue. The root issue is the evangelical church in America has violated, broken the word of God. That's the root issue. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So we specifically admit what the issue is and repent over it and ask God to forgive us individually, and ask God to forgive us collectively, and then we call on him, and we ask him to spare our nation, and we cry out to him, and we seek his face. And at that moment, there can be a radical change in the direction of America. Christianity doesn't teach fatalism. We're not Hindus or mystics. Christianity doesn't teach that you're powerless, that you're a victim. The church has been given the keys of the kingdom. But that doesn't mean you can abuse the teaching and say you can stop the Antichrist. No, you can't, because that's the inspired and errant word of God. We cry out to God, and then as we align ourselves or get into synchronization with God's will as revealed in his word, his entire word, and seek his face, as long as they sought the Lord, they continued to prosper, God begins to remove the curses to whatever extent he chooses, and he begins to send blessing. God begins to give us leaders that are a blessing, not a curse. God begins to restore and heal our nation in all kinds of myriad ways. Because remember, the reality that we're looking at in America is simply a mirror reflection of the heart of the collective Christian community and the collective uh, Christian church. Everything you see going on is a mirror reflection of what's going on in our hearts. If we repent, there can be a change in that reality, and God desires to change. In fact, there can be a last days revival, an end times revival, and I would suggest to you there could be, and, and I believe God would 
like there to be a third great awakening which radically changes our nation in some kind of temporal sense. When I say temporal, I don't know the, the time span. But it needs to be done. I'm not talking about an apostate counterfeit revival at all. I'm talking about a biblical revival. I'm not talking about a, a, a revival that, that, that the focus is on uh, weird behavior. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a revival that departs from the Word of God. I'm not talking about false prophets or false teachers or false prophecy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a biblically based authentic revival like the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening that radically transformed America for the better. That's what I'm talking about. And I believe that God wants that with all my heart. He has given us one last window of opportunity. I, I don't want to keep um, bringing it up in a repetitive manner uh, because we are all you as well as me, desensitized by, by people saying, you know, this is the end. But the, the fact is, <laughs> the vital signs for America from secular ana analysts are extremely grim in the near future, very near future. So our only response is to First, individually, if the church we belong to will not do it, first of all, you need to get out of there, just like Lot got out of Sodom. You need to get out of an apostate church. What are you doing in an apostate church for crying out loud? You know what that says? It says you're apostate. Well, you can rationalize it. I'm there to convert other people. I wonder that how that would play out to God if you joined the children of Israel while they were having sexual orgies and worshiping the golden calf while Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments and your answer to God as to why you were worshiping the golden calf and involved in an in orgy was because you're there to influence other people. That is like, that's not going to fly with God. Good try, but it's not going to fly with God. My heart, your heart, is desperately wicked, and we are capable of deceiving ourselves. So, we plug into a community of believers that honors God's word and understands that we are at a crisis point, and we begin to individually repent daily. It's not a mantra. We repent of our sins. We repent as intercessors of the sins of America and we cry out to God that he would pour out his spirit on this nation and spare us judgment because judgment is here. And I encourage you to do that with everything in me. I've devoted my life to that. Preparing to give you this message involved one of the most intense spiritual battles of my life in the last three days. I cannot tell you the intensity of the spiritual warfare that was going on inside me. It was like, even my wife said to me, she kept holding my hand in the middle of the night because I was talking out loud in a dream state. And she just sounded, she said something to the effect, it sounded like you, like you were in hell and you were trying to uh, uh, debate or, 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 or you know, d discuss something. I was in hell because I remember the dreams and what the dreams were saying to me. And we all, including myself, we all are imperfect. That's why we're saved by grace. Thank God for His grace. We all, if we're honest, our, our entire nation, and you, whatever nation you live in, that you're watching me, we're all suffering right now to varying degrees because of the economic pressure and the socioeconomic stresses in our nation and world right now. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of things that are causing enormous psychological turmoil and anxiety and depression and stress. It, it's we're all under 
whether we realize it or not, a tremendous spiritual oppression and darkness. And we're all, whether we realize it or not, are engaged in spiritual warfare against it. Through prayer, through reading his word, fighting it. Fighting off, you, you may be fighting off depression and anxiety and weariness and all kinds of things, and you don't understand where it's coming from. I'm telling you, it's coming from this collective atmosphere that we live under, uh, which is a suppression, a suppression and oppression that is demonically motivated and energized. And I really don't, I, 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 the Bible teaches spiritual warfare. I will not lower uh, the truthfulness of God's word to debate with people about the subject who raise up um, intellectually and theologically false arguments against spiritual warfare by raising up straw man arguments. That's dishonest. And I won't argue with a dishonest person. When we pray, we're in spiritual warfare. When we read God's word, we're in spiritual warfare. If we weren't in spiritual warfare, the Apostle Paul would not have told us to put on the full armor of God. Gird yourselves with the Lord the loins of truth, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, put on the breastplate of righteousness, pick up the shield of faith, um, put on the helmet of salvation, pick up the sword of the spirit. That is the apostle Paul telling us to dress spiritually like a soldier because the, the truth that the apostle Paul is communicating is that you are a spiritual warrior in Involved in a spiritual battle. I mean, if you just grasp what Paul is teaching in that simple passage of Scripture where he admonishes true believers in Christ to put on the full armor of God, there should be instant recognition by the power of the Spirit revealing the Word of God that we are involved in a spiritual battle, thus spiritual warfare. To, to negate that with an erroneous argument is insanity, and I won't do it. And Paul tells us in that same chapter, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. He's telling us that we're fighting a spiritual battle with invisible beings, a demonic hierarchy, if you will. He's telling us that for a reason. Behind the political struggle, the economic struggle, the societal struggle, even the church struggle, behind it all are principalities and powers. And the only way you can fight uh, effectively that warfare is to engage in spiritual warfare using spiritual weapons because it's not a earthly fight. For example... The Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons of our warfare are not earthly. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? Strongholds are satanic ideologies, arguments, belief systems. Strongholds are anything that exists internally in the mind and the spirit and the social structure of a nation or a world. That, that represents the kingdom of Lucifer in opposition to the kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of heaven. That's what a stronghold is. And it can only be dismantled by a spiritual weapon, such as the sword of truth, which is the word of God. But you can't, you can't exercise, you cannot be an effective spiritual warrior. And by the way, if you need more teaching on this, I have plenty of free resources at paulmcguire.org or paulmcguire.com, McGuire is M-C-G-U-I-R-E. I have free videos and my books are there and free YouTubes and articles and all kinds of stuff that will help you. Plus a free uh, blog and a free e-blast prophetic newsletter. Uh, okay, so we're fighting the spiritual warfare using spiritual weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is happening in America right now are, is happening on two levels. 
We have the physical level where we see economics, politics, social factors, behavior, sexual behavior, customs, thinking, beliefs, ideology, music, culture, film, news media, social interactions, etc., etc., possible military conflicts, lawlessness. All of that is the physical dimension. It's very real, and a Christian is not to divorce himself from physical reality. A Christian must be involved in the nitty-gritty physical reality, not escaping from it. The Christian must be involved in physical reality. That means you have to be intelligent and know what's going on. You have to have an awareness of what's really happening and not be an airhead for Jesus, which is an oxymoron, because you have the mind of Christ. How could you be an airhead for Jesus if you have the mind of Christ? You can't. It means you're not renewing your mind with the Word of God. And a basic study of, of certain things that are happening around you. So there's the physical struggle. And then there's the struggle in the other dimension, which is just as real, even though you can't see it with your senses. It's just as real. And by the way, the physical dimension is ultimately caused by what's happening in the spiritual uh, dimension. But you cannot be an effective spiritual warfare, a warrior, if you reject God's word in any part of it, including the prophetic scriptures. To the degree that you reject God's word as the inspired and errant word of God, that reduces your effectiveness as a spiritual warrior because the Apostle Paul says, pick up the sword of truth. That is the word of God. But you can't pick up the sword of truth or the word of God if you reject the truth or throw out huge segments of the Bible because it's not politically correct or doesn't meet your, your comfortable middle class, and there is no middle class anymore, that's a mythology, uh, theological bias. You can't. You can't reject the word of God in your personal life and in your corporate church life, you can't throw away and reject the Word of God and at the same time pick up the sword of the Spirit. You can't have it both ways. So either if you've rejected the Word of God, you cannot be a spiritual warrior. Do you understand where I'm going with this? So if you are part of a church where they have rejected the Word of God, you are essentially useless in the spiritual battle and you're useless because you have no offensive weapon as a spiritual warrior which is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God you can't engage in the spiritual battle because you've thrown away the weapon that you were given which is the word of God that's how serious a sin it is for any church or Christian to reject God's word and that's why America's in the mess that it's in that is the primary sin. That is where the repentance needs to be focused. And if you're not focusing on that, then you're just playing church. Okay, so there has to be a confrontation with the principalities and powers, the territorial spirits, the cosmocratus, the demonic powers that, that have now been invited over America in another dimension. The, 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 uh, the prophet Daniel talked about territorial spirits. So if you have a problem with that, take it up with the prophet Daniel. The issue is that there must be a confrontation with these spirits and the spirit of Antichrist, which has invaded the nation. But that can only be done through spiritual weapons. Fasting, prayer, teaching, communicating, educating people with the Word of God, uh, evangelism, um, uh, making disciples of all nations, occupy until he comes. These are all essential components of engaging in spiritual warfare. And this is what we must do or we're going to lose our nation. We've been given one last window of opportunity. We can see revival. We can see the power of God come down on our nation. 
but we're going to have to get serious and repent sp specifically and make choices such as to repent from rejecting the Word of God and embrace the Word of God, to cry out to God, to seek God. If we do that, without that being a conflict with God's end times prophetic program, there's hope for America or your nation. But apart from the divine intervention of Jesus Christ in our nation right now, the gravity of the situation is so serious. We're on the Titanic and it's, it's going to sink apart from divine intervention. And there's only one group of people in this nation that's called the Church or the Bride of Christ that has been given the responsibility by Christ himself to intercede for the nation in prayer and call upon the supernatural intervention of God to spare America from an awful judgment or whatever your nation you're in because the spiritual principles I've outlined are applicable to any nation. Now is the hour and now is the time. There's no other hour and no, there's no other time. This is it. This is it. We are at the final moment. I'm Paul McGuire. Again, I tell you this because I love you and I'm motivated by love. You can uh, get more information at paulmcguire.org or paulmcguire.com. I hope you spread this um, um, YouTube far and wide to as many people as possible. It contains truth. I may be an imperfect messenger. I'm sure I am. But God uses what he has, and he wants to use you too. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire.